room and the, the tone and the mood and stuff. So if you didn't have any plans, 8 to 9.30 tomorrow in the atrium if you're, if you're interested in that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Victoria, but again, you know, she's not a resident expert. This is a collaborative learning environment, so, you know, questions and feedback and stuff are, are welcome, right? I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak for you either. So, for sure. Well, hey guys, what's going on? Um, I, I have a lot to cover, I'm going to just be honest right now, um, but I don't think I'm going to get through all of it, so we're just going to like go into this and like hope for the best. Let's see what happens. Um, but we're going to see chapter 8. Um, so we're going to be talking about racism for the most part, I'm not going to go into the definitions like the difference between race and ethnicity because I think you guys are all well educated together into intro so I'm not gonna go about that. But I will be talking about systematic racism. I won't cover too much of colorblind racism because we don't have enough time. Um, and I'm also gonna talk about systemic racism because there's a difference between systematic and systemic racism which um, there's not a lot of, if you were to look up systemic or systematic racism, it's going to direct you to systemic racism. Um, but they're different, and um, I think it's important to make that distinction. Same thing with the difference between racism and prejudice, prejudice um, because there is a difference. Um, I think a lot of people think those go hand in hand, but they don't necessarily have to. Um, so what's the difference between racism and prejudice? Teacher? I'm the problem student. Is there an extra PowerPoint? <coughs> no, I want you. Okay, well, I'm going to get you an extra copy then. I can't believe well, You'll get a special one. Yeah, you'll you get yeah, yeah. you know, like, yeah, yeah, You've got connections. Okay, I'm so sorry that I interrupted you. No, you're going to carry on. No, please interrupt me. Um, <laughs> so, the, what's the difference? So, racism, a system of advantages based off race. This is done by David Woolman. Um, I got this actually from, has anyone read Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? It's, please read it, it's by Beverly Tatum, write it down, write it down. Um, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And it's by Beverly Tatum, um, she's a sociologist as well, um, but she looks at it a different way of looking at racism. A lot of people define racism with like, somehow tying in prejudice, but this definition is a little bit more concrete, I would say. Um, this definition of racism is useful because it allows us to see that racism, like any other form of oppression, um, is not only a personal ideology based on based on racial prejudice, but a system involving culture messages, institutional policies, practices, as well as beliefs and actions of individuals. Um, so it's important to make that distinction. There's that as well. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that, but I already said that. Um, but another definition that's commonly used amongst anti-racist educators is prejudice plus power. I'm going to write that with a red marker because it's important. Sorry about the markers in here. You'll see. Oh, no. <laughs> that's OK. They don't work that well. Prejudice plus power. And you said that was a, a definition of racism used. Yeah, um, a lot of like times in my research, they like I said, they tie in prejudice with uh, power or prejudice with racism, and they don't necessarily have to go hand in hand. Um, racial prejudice, when com when combined with social power, uh, which is like access to like social, culture, and economic resources and decision making, leads to the institutionalized. Um, racist and racism in practices. But this is a little bit problematic, so let's cross that up. Just cross it up, because that's not what we're talking about. We're gonna be talking about racism a little bit more in depth than that. Um, this isn't, racism plus power does not cover enough when it talks about racism. It doesn't explain a lot of things that are going on in America now. Uh, so when we are talking about racism when it comes to America, we have to look at more like a like a systematic and systemic racism. So let's write instead of 
prejudice plus power, let's put systematic racism instead. Because when we're talking about America, it's so, racism is so ingrained in our society. And when I mean ingrained, I mean it's like the fabric. So if we're talking, if we're looking at racism as like a tree, so I'm gonna draw a tree, I'm not really good at drawing trees, but if we were to draw a tree, and you have all these roots down here, can you guys kind of all see that? There's all your roots. This is, this is where the racism is. It starts from the bottom, it starts from the roots. It's ingrained in our government, it's ingrained in our laws. Um, and then you have racism up here, which is where your institutions are. That so, helps so much. That helps so much. Because I've been hearing in conversation lately mm -hmm. about, you know, systemic and then systematic. And even I, Victoria and I were kind of sitting across from each other in the office this morning going, okay, you know, because th this is kind of a, it's, it's not a new distinction, it's newer in conversation, right. probably. So I love the, the tree. And so she's got this slide, and just for you all to be clearer on this, like I became clear, systemic being the roots, so systemic being the roots is more foundational. Right, so systemic, both theoretical and concept and reality, that the United States was founded as a racist society, that racism is thus embedded in all social institutions and structures. So I'm gonna get more into this later on in the PowerPoint, but I wanna make these distinctions pretty quickly just because I'm gonna be kind of using them interchangeably. Mostly I'm gonna be talking about systemic racism, not so much of the systematic racism, because the systematic racism we see right now, yeah. police brutality, we see that in housing discrimination, like all that stuff, the stuff that perpetuates the stereotypes and the racism, that's your systematic racism. But your systemic racism is the Jim Crow law. Um, housing Discrimination Acts, you know, in the 60s and 50s, um, stuff like that. So we're going to get into that, um, but in my notes I put, rooted in racist foundations, systemic racism today is composed of intersecting, overlapping, code-independent racist institutions, policies, practices, ideas, behaviors that are un that make an unjust amount of resources. So when we're looking at systemic racism, like, we have to make sure make the distinction that this is the root of the problem, mm -hmm. okay? Systemic is the root. Mm -hmm. Systemic is the root. Systematic is the leaves, the, the, the perpetuation of, the cycle of the racism. Okay. So what ends up happening is that we, okay, I'm about to like mess up my whole lecture, the whole <laughs> outline of it, but systemic racism is like the founding fathers coming with like the three-fifths law, the articles that are put into place. But then even though they end up getting rid of that, it still is perpetuated in the institutions that we see, you know, later on to this day, stuff that's still happening as well. Very well put and clarified. I think that uh, Yeah, and like I said, if you I mean even if you look up systematic racism, it's gonna take you to systemic racism. Because a lot of times we still put them together, they're kind of the same word. But in academia, if you were to do maybe more digging, like research and databases, there gonna, there's going to be a distinction. A book that I highly recommend for anyone to read if you are really interested in like history is this book called Racist America, which is where I'm getting a lot of my information from. Um, it's by this guy named Joe Feigen. And he goes into policies that are put into place, um, the different types of racism that we see um, to this day. Um, he goes into conversation about um, colorblind racism just a little bit, um, but mostly looking at the systemic and systematic racism that we have in our society. Any questions? Yeah? Okay. Next on my list, we're gonna talk about White privilege. The white privilege, the systematic advantages of being white. Um, so, once again, systematic, the perpetuation, the cycle of um, advantages that are given to white people. 
Um, it's written, has anyone heard of Peggy McIntosh? No? Um, but she wrote this, kind of like this little, I wouldn't call it a book, but it almost like an article called White Privilege and Packing the Invisible Knapsack. Um, and she basically gives off a list of things that she receives just because she's white. Just because she's white, she's able to find a job, get a house in here, get along without being questioned, um, pay things in cash and not be questioned. Um, I was gonna print it out for all of you just so you guys can have any kind of look at your own privileges because it's gonna be different depending on your on your social class for some of it. That's the only thing I have kind of a problem with it is that it doesn't really look at it to like the classism of it, but nevertheless, it's still really good. And I'll put it up on Eagle for you guys to see too so you guys can kind of be familiar with it as well. There was um, a good example of white privilege very recently with the airlines, Delta Airlines. Mm -hmm. yes. Did you see that? Yeah, I heard about it. Just a little bit. I didn't get to read too much. Well, it was a, a doctor. They required a doctor on board. Yeah. This black doctor gets a black lady, female, and she goes to the front. The stewardess says, uh, says oh no, we don't need nurses. And as a older white male came up, they accepted him as a doctor without any proof. So she was a doctor capable of doing the job. So the privilege in that was she has he had the privilege of being seen as a doctor without question, whereas they automatically questioned her. So. Another good example, which is maybe a little bit closer to home, remember a couple weeks ago I asked you guys to like help me find a job basically, like I needed a new job. And a lot of you guys put down like waitressing jobs or serving jobs. But something that me and Jenny were kind of talking about is that it's very difficult for a person of color to just be like, all right, I'm just gonna hop into this serving job and just like hope for the best. Because what ends up happening is that you may not get tipped as well, um, depending on where you go to do your serving, um, depends on how well you're gonna get tipped. So if I were to go to a place called, what is it called? Jean's Place. Jean's Place has a, a certain demographic there, um, but I went there one time for karaoke night and, uh, this guy just had like this humongous like Confederate flag like just like imprinted like on his shirt. And so if I were a server there, that would make me extremely uncomfortable, but I would still have to serve him. You know, I would still have to, you know, be as nice as possible. But for him, he could look at me and be like, oh well, you know, I don't tip black folks. He may not say that, you know, outright, but he may have that mindset. His white racial framework, in other words, I was going to identify, but can't at the moment. But um, <laughs> white racial framework is basically just like the implicit biases that you, um, that you have. It's kind of, it's like, it's like you were put on a pair of glasses. And you would see the way that white people view everything else. So a lot of times when we're looking at like racism, they talk about well, how do black people feel. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's important. How do people of color feel, but how do white people feel? And that's a little bit different. for Because for white people, it could be, you know, something that they don't even see, something that's so ingrained that they're completely unaware of. And that's that white privilege. They don't see the white privilege. It's something that is ingrained, something that you just inherit over time, over generations. Um, so, yeah, any questions? So far, any comments? You know I do. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, I, I was in a class this summer, and it was it was about cultural competence, and the instructor had us had us look at the um, unpacking the invisible knapsack. So I really I've got a, a note down here that will we will make copies or we'll we'll put um, those areas we'll put it on Eagle. And what she had us do was she had us pick three of the areas that that I never really considered where, where I had privilege. And then if there were people of color in the class, um, they were to share their experiences, you know, where they were more likely to have not had that privilege and had to be more focused on it. And I, I, I can't remember the ones I have, but we will do that. We'll, we'll bring the list into class and then we'll, we'll kind of circle areas where 
You know, I've never really had to consider that, probably largely because of my race. And then some people can talk about, well, I have to consider that every day because of my race. And it's, it's, really, it's really phenomenal. So we'll, I'm glad you brought that up, Victoria. And then the, um, we, were we, we were talking about those jobs. I wanted so desperately to be able to tell her that like, no, just go, just go try the, 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 the service job. You know, maybe people, this or that, but in, in my heart of hearts, I, you know, I know that those implicit biases exist and I, I didn't, I don't want her to experience that. But then the fact of like, you know, serving as a college student can be a pretty decent job for yeah. pay. So then here I am, you know, another kind of inequity in that is that because I know that you're at greater likelihood for experiencing the outcome of those implicit biases, I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage you to go get one of those service jobs, which is in turn can be a fairly lucrative job for a college student. So again, that's not something that, you know, somebody yeah. not of color would even have to necessarily kind of consider or take. You may have stock. to consider, like, if you're a female, like, how am I, how am I going to be treated? Sure. Am I going to, you know, get passes at me? Are people going to be? Sure. Um, sexual comments about me, but when you're a person of color, it's not just going to be based off of how they sexualize you, but it's going to be based off of things that they think they know about you, so stereotypes. They're like, well, you know, I'm not going to tip her because I don't want that money going to, you know, her children she doesn't even take care of. I don't want to support her drug habit. They may not necessarily think that, like in the forefront of their head, but in the back of their head, these implicit biases, these stereotypes are sitting there kind of firing off like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about this. Um, and something else that needs to be kind of said is that when it comes to white privilege, I have a lot of people that kind of ask me, well, I don't really have privilege because, you know, I'm in lower class. You know, I don't really have, you know, any money. I don't really benefit from anything. But just because you have class privilege doesn't mean that you still don't get race privilege. So the first thing when people see you is going to be, you're white. You know, so they're already they're already going to have these stereotypes like, oh, you know, she's probably in college. You know, she's probably with her parents. You know, she's probably got a really good life. Blah blah blah. But when they see me, they're going to insinuate, well, maybe, you know, maybe she's you know she's probably got children. She probably doesn't know who the father is. Or it could be, you know, she's on drugs. Or it could be that, oh, you know, you see her hair, you know, her hair's probably dirty. You know, she probably smokes weed and she probably does all this other stuff. Um, so that has to be made clear that even though you, you may not have class privilege, you still will have race privilege still. And that's that's really important to note that they're, you know, they're not one of the, they're not one of the same. There, there is class privilege and there is race privilege. Like, yeah. I would say that I have some sort of class privilege, mm -hmm. but even so, if I, for instance, I went shopping at Abercrombie when we saw that Abercrombie, and I got followed all through the store, all through it. Kept, and they were just like popping up out of nowhere. They were just like, hey, you need any help? You need any help? Are you doing okay? Yeah, I'm, doing, yeah, I'm fine, I'm all right. Okay, turn the corner, hey, you still, you still finding everything okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm good, dude. Like, yeah. And you think it's good customer service at first, but mm -hmm. when you're when you're black, you are if you're aware of your blackness, you are so aware of everyone and how everyone probably thinks of you. So you walk into a situation or into a room, you're already you're already looking at everyone like, okay, she she's giving me dirty looks, all right. So she's probably thinking this about me. Oh, he is rolling his eyes and he's packing up to go. I wonder if it's because I'm black. You know, you automatically have these kind of like defense mechanisms. My uh, my professor, who I, I love so much, is a guy at NIU, she says that every time she leaves the house, she puts on a, a mask, a whole guard up. Because when you leave that house, you don't know what you're going to encounter. You don't know what kind of people, what kind of attitudes you're going to encounter. You don't know if people are going to you know, think this of you, or you don't even know what people are going to say. Like I've had, I had a teacher tell me one time, what did she say? It was here at Rock Valley, I'm not letting off the professor, but she said, mm -hmm. Oh, you uh, you write so well for you know for a black person. 
And I was like, well, what, well, what do you mean? And she was like, you know, you're dramatically corrected, you know, you speak, you know, very eloquent for yourself, and, you know, I just, I just applaud you for it. And you're sitting there, and you're kind of like, um, that's that, not a compliment. That, 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 that's not a compliment. <laughs> um, but, you know, you have those stereotypes there, and when you're white, you don't necessarily, people aren't going to think that of you. They're just going to assume that, like, oh, you're probably educated. And if you're not educated, they're going to be, you know, use some sort of, like, background. Oh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe her mom just didn't have the money to put her in school, right? Or maybe she just didn't have the resources. But when you're black, it becomes, you know, oh, well, you're probably stuck on drugs. You're probably skipping school, you know, stuff like that. Did you have a question in the back? Oh, I was just thinking, like, how you're talking about how your teacher said, like, you write, like, good for a black person. Mm -hmm. I've had that, you know, I'm not even fully black. Mm -hmm. I was at work and we were aprons with our name on. Yeah. And my name's Shayla. And this old lady, she was white, she came up to me, she was like, oh, you have a nice name for a colored girl. Ooh, and she was like, she was like, most of you know, colored girls, and she just named our names. So I just like, you know, looked at her like, you know, what do you mean? Like, what? Yeah. And it was just crazy, like, just thinking like, that, did you really just feel comfortable to say that to me? And then, yeah, did. But did you really just say that? And it was just like, but it makes you think like even that was just like job, just seeing, you know, names. If you have a certain name, you may not get hired just because there are people just off your name. Yeah. People have these stereotypes. And something, my mom's raising her hand, I kind of already feel like I know what she's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm about to say then. Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe not, but um, something that I know that my mom has told me that she was very conscious of was naming all three of us. Um, there's there's three girls. I'm the oldest out of three. But um, so my name is Victoria Page. Um, my middle sister is Courtney Aaliyah. My little sister is Brittany Savannah. Um, and we all have stereotypical white-ish names. Um, just because my mom was fearful that when we went out to the workforce or went out to get you know to go to school, that people would automatically assume like, oh she's black. Oh let's not hire her. Or you know we already have enough black people. Or you know I don't know if they're gonna fit in here. You know, our cultures are different. It's like I'm American, like our cultures are not that different. Um, but that's that's that privilege I'm talking about. Like if you're white, you don't necessarily have to think about that. You don't have to think about how your name is gonna portray across when you go for a job interview. You don't have to think about you know how you have to dress or how you have to look when you go to places because you're probably not gonna be stereotyped because of that. You know, you could probably walk into any store with a backpack on and no one's gonna think really anything of it. I'd just like to say this and I'll let you move on. There's a book, it's an autobiography of an ex-colored man, and it was called Ex-Colored Man. And it was written by well, James Milton Johnson, I believe, I don't, don't know for sure. But one of the comments that he made in that, he says that as a black person, you go through your life and everything that happens to you has to be filtered through the prism of race. And we all know what happens when you shine light into a prism, it just kind of fractures in all different directions. Mm -hmm. So when you go to a restaurant, and if you're sitting down at the table, and the waitress comes up and the plate happens to slide in front of you, you ask yourself a question. Did she do that intentionally because I'm black, or did it just, was it an accident? You have to process those things through that prism. And you come to terms with it, and it's a process that you do almost unconsciously. And the police officer stops me. Is he going to hassle me? Why did he, you know? Is he going to shoot me? How fast do I need to go to for my license? Shoot me. <laughs> so, you know, that is something that white privilege, you have no idea just what it's like or how, how, it, how it goes because you don't have to even process that. You wake up in the morning, as I said the other day, you know what's going to happen for your day. You're just going to go through your day and it's just a natural day. But we're, we're going to go through our day. Uh, I consider myself to be a political animal. Uh, and I have to process those things as a black person, daily. Okay. I'm finished. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. uh, Thank you for sure. A while ago, you had, you had mentioned something about the Confederate flag. Are you going to be speaking more on that later? Or can I just... Not necessarily on the Confederate <laughs> flag, but I will be speaking on, I don't want to give it away yet, but we'll get there. Okay. We'll get there. All right. So please, yeah, good. hold that thought. Um, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say? She said it. Oh, no, she did. She did. She did. Yeah. I know my mom. Um, let me tell you guys quickly, and I didn't even tell Victoria this, 
I had a student yesterday, I, I still like processing this. I had a, a student that I know fairly well, um, and she is a, a, a female of color, student of mine, she's a student worker here at the college. And she came to my office and she was really, really, really distraught, like in tears. So like, I grabbed the Kleenex because if she was in tears, I'm going to be in tears. So we're like, I'll grab the Kleenex. And then she's telling me she's having a hard time. She's overwhelmed um, with stuff going on. And so she's telling me this. And I'm like, this is not the first time I've had a student in my office that's overwhelmed. We'll work, you know, we'll work our way through this. You know, it's not, I don't want it to be the, you know, this crisis, end of the world kind of, you know, thing. So we're working through it, and then she stops halfway through our conversation, and she goes, I feel like I have to explain to you how I look today. I, I gotta explain to you this jacket and these shoes. It didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind. Um, but then when I looked at her jacket, it was, a cool, it was a cool looking jacket, but nothing out of the ordinary. It was just like this kind of, I don't know if it's leather or pleather or whatever. It was just a nice looking leather-ish jacket. And then she had on a pair of what I would consider like average, average Nike tennis shoes, like a pair I would own or anybody would own. And I'm like, what, a, what, a, like what about, what about it? And she's like, well, I don't want you to think, I don't want you to think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm taking advantage. Like I don't, I don't buy myself, you know, I don't buy myself new stuff, and, and I don't, and and like, and these shoes, like, you know, she's like, my feet were just hurting so bad because I'm on my feet all day. But that's why I got these like tennis shoes, and I'm like, what the hell? Like, why? Like, you, what? No, you don't have to explain any of this to me. But she kept going on and on about it. And when you were talking about like stereotypes, and you were talking about everything being filtered through um, color, I took away that she was very much used to people judging her, and and and. Um, you know, this likelihood that she's maybe receiving financial aid or something from the school. Therefore, she doesn't get to wear a, like a decent jacket, or therefore she doesn't get to wear a comfortable pair of tennis shoes. And I was like, you're poor, you need to look poor. Yeah, you're poor, you need to look poor. And, and you know, she looks like any, any, you know, student. So I just wrote that, that, you know, she was so used to this assumption based on maybe her race and her sex and her class status, that this assumption that, that people have that she's taking advantage of a system. And here she went on and on about this jacket and these tennis shoes that she has obviously had to explain to people before. Where I, I wouldn't, I would not feel compelled, and maybe some of you right now, if you just look at the outfits where you're wearing, if you're wearing tennis shoes and a jacket or something like that, do you feel the need to explain that to people? You know, so you and I will talk about that that more. But it was just this experience that I had yesterday. Yeah. Believe it. Do you have a question? Can I just want to? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was been a server and bartender for like five, six years mm -hmm. already, and then um, I waited on these people that are from like the deep rural south. They're like railroad workers, and they were kept looking at me, and then they asked one of my coworkers, like, what race is she? She was like, oh, well, she's half Mexican. And they're like, well, we don't want job stealers waiting on us, so we want you to wait on us. So I was like, all right, whatever. Wow. It bothered me, but I can't show a game face at work. Yeah. <laughs> so then I got pulled over by a cop one time, and my last name was Ortiz. And he looked at my license. He didn't even ask me for my insurance or anything yet. He's like, or geez, because I was all the way out by Route 2 in Meridian mm -hmm. by Byron. And he's like, what are you doing all the way out here? I was like, my boyfriend lives out here. And he's like, I'll be right back. Like, he went to the thing. Yeah, you can't just be like out there. You can't just be like, oh, yeah, I live out here. Yeah, yeah like, you can't just be like, I'm just out here. But like, he, I was they about to get my that. insurance, and he's just like, I'll be right back. He took my license back to his car and was like typing in all my information and stuff like that. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Wow. But just like how he said, what are you doing out here? Or geez. Yeah, I can come out here. No. <laughs> I, had, I had a very similar situation when I got my, I, I have a 2015 Honda Civic and I just bought it. It was like probably November, October. 
on when it's probably November, but I got pulled over the same day. And mind you, the car I had before that was a 1998 Honda Civic, and I never got pulled over. But as soon as I got a new car, brand new, I got pulled over, and his first question was, whose car is this? And I was like, it's my car. And then, like, I, I just bought it from Ableton, like, I can show you all the paperwork, I, I literally just bought it, you know, my name's on it. And he was like, okay, well, I'll be right back. And he's like, well, I can't find your car registered. And I'm like, probably because I just bought it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just bought it. Like, like probably a couple cool hours ago, like, I bought the car, went to work, now I'm out, about to go see my boyfriend, like, and he was like, okay, well, just drive safe. Like, and I was driving the speed limit, like, he just randomly pulled me over, and I was like, okay, weirdo. Um, so, yeah, that, that happens, but that's something that you're super conscious of when you're a person of color. You're very conscious of how you're perceived. Um, it's almost like having this like hyper awareness around you. Every time, everywhere you go, you, you're automatically like, how am I about to be judged? How am I about to be perceived? I mean, I would love to just walk out of my house all the time in sweatpants and a hoodie or a t-shirt and like whatever else. But I know if I do that, the people are gonna, oh, she's poor. Oh, she's at the grocery store. She's probably like, you know, food for her children. Oh, and she's paying with stamps. Speaking of that, another quick story is uh, another professor here, I will not name her. Um, <laughs> it's not Jenny. Um, but she's my best friend. Um, she told me she has four kids and she's at Target. And, you know, someone's in front of her, they're having a conversation or whatever. And, you know, the lady leaves. She goes up to bring up all her stuff, and the lady says, oh, we don't accept Link here. Mind you, this is a woman of color, four kids, probably looking a little frantic because she's got four kids that are like ready to go home, and they're just like, oh, we don't take Link. And she's like, I wasn't even going to pay with Link. I'm going to pay with my the card or cash. And she's like, oh, okay, I just want to make sure. But it's just like, why didn't you say to the woman in front of, in front of you? You know, it's like, we don't accept Link, but because she's black, she has a bunch of kids with her, automatically. automatically thinking, oh, she must be on some sort of assistance. So, I'm gonna move on from there, but we'll, just, oh, are you ready? You want, you got some? Mom, please. No. <laughs> I, had a, a, I had a story similar please, no, to this that. this is dialogue. This is the most informal thing I'm doing. Okay, okay, well, anyway, when you guys were younger, I had three girls, and they was, looked all the same age, they were like stair steps. Anyway, I would constantly would not leave the house unless I had on my wedding ring, because I did not want to be judged of being this, you know, the stereotypical black woman, got three kids, no, not married. So, I mean, I could be halfway down the street and like, oh, I have my ring on, let me go back home and get my ring, so I would not be judged, you know, being that woman, so. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any more comments, questions before I move on? All right, so the big question I always get by anyone, black, white, anything, can black people be racist or can people of color be racist? Um, and that kind of depends on how you define racism. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wrote down, of course, people, any racial group, can hold biases, attitudes towards a certain group. Um, we can all cite examples of times where uh, we've had someone be prejudiced against us, whether you're white or black. Um, capable behavior is capable behavior no matter what it is. But when I'm asked, can people of color be racist? I reply, the answer depends on how you define racism. The answer is yes if one defines racism as racial prejudice. And racial prejudice is just, let's say, I have a prejudice against someone that's Asian American. Like, all Asians are good at math. Or all Asians, you know, eat their dogs. Or something like that. Like, those are prejudices. I'm not necessarily racist, but I'm holding these prejudices. But if the answer is no, the answer is no, if, we define racism as a system of advantages based off of race. So, plain and simple, no. People of color cannot be racist because they do not benefit from racism. They, for instance, like for housing discrimination. If I were to go for an apartment 
and you know I t I'm meeting with the landlord and letting them know like yep I, you know I have all this in place blah blah blah, blah. I'm ready to come see it he meets me realizes that I'm a person of color he may not sell, show me the house or he may you know flip in and be like oh you know what I just raised the rent up to six hundred eight hundred dollars he may show you the house and then say uh, I've got some other people that are looking at it yeah. He may say I have other people looking at it, and I may never hear back from him. Never. But then, turn around, a white person could go in and sh be shown the house, and he's like, gun ho, like, yep, let's do this, really, son, let's do this right now. So, I can't, I don't benefit from racism, ever. Person of color never benefits from racism. Uh, go ahead, I'm gonna let you go. Is this the same for all countries, or just our society? It kind of depends. So, like for instance, the answer is no, only because of our history of our history of racism in this country, which I will get to. But like for instance, like in Brazil, they have racism, but it's more of like colorism. So what I mean by that is that they do a separation between dark and light skin. So the lighter you are, you're more likely perceived as rich. Um, you know, someone that has. Um, wealth to them, someone of beauty. If you're darker skinned, they're gonna look at you that you're poor, you probably live in the slums, you know, you don't have any money, um, stuff like that. So there is some sort of like racism, but it's just like a little bit different. I think the only place that I think that's even remotely close to us is maybe like, like in the Europe area, a little bit, but even then it's not nearly like ours, for sure. So, any questions on this? Comments? No? And, okay. and ponder that a little bit, you know. I, and this takes a little to, to sink in, give it some thought, kind of, you know, kind of kind of really ponder some of some of that too. Yeah. It's, it's a good question. Because racism <coughs> if I'm defining the way I'd like to define it, system of advantages based off of race, racial prejudices does not encompass everything. It only encompasses just a small portion of racism. It's like a sub category of racism. It's not encompassing everything else. So, but, so how do we get here? Another question I always get. So how do we, how do we even get here? I'm not gonna waste your time talking about like what's going on right now. I'm sure you guys are all aware of the racism that's being, you know, thrown everywhere. Um, but I'm going to read this. We the people of the United States, in order for a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, defense, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves, our prosperity, do our name, and establish the Constitution of the United States of America. And you know what, anyone know what that is? Yeah, yeah, All right. Good. Oh, yeah, I thought you were yeah. here. Yeah, you guys <laughs> But the preamble of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at this, who do you think the Constitution was written for? White, white, white constant men in what? So, the same of the people. Before I even get to that, I'll, I'm going to put it all up there just because it's going to take you maybe a little bit to write it down, and it's already on there. But um, this is kind of kind of answer your question with like the Confederate flag. Kind of, not really. Um, but the year is 1787, the place Philadelphia. 55 men are meeting in summer's heat to write a constitution for what we call the first democratic nation. These path breaker founders created a document so radical in breaking from modern and feudal institutions that would be condemned and attacked from literally everyone in Europe. These determined radicals are all men of European origins and are most likely well off, the 40% of them. Um, about 60% are gonna be like your wealthiest men in the United States. Uh, they're gonna be the ones that's holding most of the slaves. Um, they either are or have been slave owners in the past. Um, about 40% are gonna be merchants, um, people who benefit from slavery being set into place. Um, the man who passed this very, uh, this very thing and chairs is George Washington, um, who was the richest man in the colonies at that time. Um, Washington and his colleagues create the first democratic nation, yet one for only whites. In the preamble to their 
old document, white founders cite prominently, we the people, but this phrase does not encompass people of color, Native Americans, or even women at that time. Because women at that time couldn't vote, so we all had no rights. Um, the statement of people of African descent was an important issue for the convention. Almost, what I mean that it was like important, like they spent time after time after time determining are people of African descent slaves? And if they are slaves, like how do we count them? How do we use them as tax? Because at the time they didn't even view us as humans. We were three fifths of a human. And so um, <coughs> this political gathering wasn't just about freedom. It wasn't just about creating a nation, but it was also how do they sustain wealth? How do we keep the wealth going in our country? On uh, what principle the admissions of blacks in the proportion of three-fifths could be explained? Are they admitted as citizens? Then why are they not admitted on an equality with white citizens? Are they admitted as property? Then why is not other property admitted into the equation? Um, this is by James uh, Wilson, he was a delegate from uh, Pennsylvania. Basically what ended up happening um, at a lot of these conventions, they were having discussions if black people are going to be used for cattle, then how do we tax on it? How do we tax people? How do we tax on humanity, basically? And so uh, what ended up happening is that the Southern delegates vigorously argued the matter, reached the famous three-fifths compromise on counting those as slaves for the purpose of white representation. Article 1 speaks of three groups in the new nation, free persons, Indians not taxed, and all other persons. Um, the other persons were those enslaved mostly of African descent. Whether free or enslaved African Americans were not in large white representation in the states. Um, so I say this, I say all this to say that what I mean that racism is systemic is that this is what I'm talking about, like, in the beginning of our foundation of the United States, like, we were already sitting back trying to separate us, trying to separate white people from black people, uh, white people and Native Americans. Um, and this is basically how we get to slavery, right here. And I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of what my professor said that just like blew me away. I wish I had more time. <laughs> to, to go over this in greater detail because if you, I mean, is anyone, do you know what the Atlantic Slave Trade is? I mean, obviously the name kind of says for itself, but honestly, look at it because when you look at it, you will see just how the nation was created. You can see us coming from Ghana, you can see us, most of most of the slaves were coming from West Africa coastline. If you ever get the chance to visit Africa, uh, I would go to Ghana. They have a lot of places that uh, you can see like the slaves trade. They even still have the signs in the jail cells up still. They still have some of the ships that are still sitting there. Um, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, but I say all this to kind of show that racism will always be a thing. And that probably sounds really sad to say, but I don't ever see us resolving racism. It's too embedded in our laws and in our history to change, I think. And Jenny, I don't know if you agree or disagree with that. No, I know, but something what we were talking about before, oh, um, even before you, because I, I think that's that, I mean, I want everybody to write that down, kind of your, you know, your, because that's not something we can probably, you know, talk fully about today, but kind of, you know, resolving racism, but, but um, you know, jot that down because you can work that into some of your reaction papers and, and maybe even further discussion. But that reminded me of what we were talking about before we came in today, that why you decided, because she could have come in here today and talked about like contemporary things going on, um, but tell us why you decided to go this route toward, for, for our understanding anyway. A lot of times, I didn't want to talk about like police brutality, I didn't really want to talk about Black Lives Matter, 
not because I don't think it's important. I think it's super important. I mean, it's, but to fully understand police brutality, I think you have to understand where it all comes from. So in one of my Black City classes, we talk about, we talk about this, but then we talk about even when it comes to just like slavery in general, what ended up happening is that I think when people think of slavery, they think of like the wealthy doing like all the dirty work, like doing the whippings, doing the lynching, all that stuff. But really what they're doing is they're hiring like lower middle class white men to kind of police the, the slaves. And so police brutality is kind of tied into that era of Black people being policed, black people being targeted, um, all the way down to slavery, whether uh, you have, I can't even like explain it, but basically I wanted to go over this just because I want to make it known that this police brutality isn't something that's just new. This isn't something that's just popped up and just started happening. It wasn't like, all right, let's just start just beating black people and just killing them in the streets. It was more, it's more tactical than that. And a lot of these laws that are put into place over the years, whether it's new Jim Crow, or not new Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws, or um, housing laws, or my favorite, the war on drugs, that stuff is ingrained in our society, it's ingrained in our, in our laws and our constitutions. And so to just talk about, you know, Black Lives Matter, police brutality, you know, racism in America. You can't talk about racism in America without talking about the history of the racism in America. You can't talk about, you can't talk about the tree if you don't know the roots. You know, you can't tell what kind of tree it is without knowing, you know, the roots of it. You can't tell how the tree grows without knowing how the roots is being watered and seeded. And it's being watered and seeded through systematic racism. So you have your systemic racism, which is like the Constitution, the preamble, what it was written for, who it was written for. And then you have your systematic racism, and that's the perpetuation of you know, housing discrimination, uh, institutions that are put into place to keep people of color oppressed. And I think that will always be a thing. Yes? Uh, I go back to this three-fifths of a person idea. And to my understanding that one of the reasons that that came to be three-fifths of the person is because the South, which is primarily a rural situation, would not have had equal representation in the, the 13 colonies right. if they did not include the slaves and make them three-fifths of the person. Now, this is, you heard me say earlier that I consider my life to be a, a, a political life. And as a black person in America, Everything that has happened to black people in America has been as a result of some type of legislation. We got the three-fifths of a person in uh, the Constitution. We were emancipated by the Republican government in 63. They actually passed, in 1865, laws that are, were actually more progressive than the civil rights laws that were passed in 19... 65. But the African Americans at that time lived a pretty pretty decent life, I'd say, after the freedom. They were elected to Congress. They were elected to, uh, I don't think there was ever a black senator, but they held offices in the South. But as a result of an election, I think it was Hayes, I'm not sure, some of these American US history majors can help me. Right. But they, they negotiated to pull the federal troops, who actually protected my rights mm -hmm. as a slave then, pull them out of the South, and that's when the Confederacy kind of rose up again and came about with the old Jim Crow laws that took away uh, any privileges that you had. They created poll taxing, uh, something that's going on today. And you know, it's almost like history is recycling itself. Because when we had uh, civil rights legislation passed in 1965, right. uh, it gave us, what, the right to vote again. It uh, protected our rights to employment. It did a lot of things 
that were passed 100 years ago. Mm. Now we see what's happening in the political arena now is that they are, the Supreme Court restricted voting rights, took the um, voting rights legislation and disbanded. Now they had 14, 15 states immediately come up with voter restrictions. You gotta have an ID card. A lot of folks don't have cars, don't have those kinds of things. So it's just kind of recycling itself and you see that there's a lot of racial tension in the country today. So, I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Let me, Tom, I, what I wrote, I think this is a good question too, and, and what I wrote down about all this stuff that we're talking about right now, and I think is a good question and plays into this, um, I don't want to say it right, systematic. Um, I wrote, why was I never taught any of this in school? Or why was I never exposed to kind of any of this, you know, history and things like that. I feel like you want to answer it. But wait, but wait, I'm not done, Andre. Um, then what you were saying, there is a documentary, if you have not seen it, and since we're all talking about books and documentaries, um, it's called Slavery by Another Name, and it talks about that Reconstruction era where there was federal funds and reconstruction of, of like the South, but then it was pulled yeah. and it, it reverted right back. So um, if you like documentaries or you like this topic and you like docu documentaries and you like learning a history that maybe you weren't necessarily taught in school, um, it's called Slavery by Another Name and it's, it's the, the methods of control that were put into, new methods of control that were put into place when Jim Crow was outlawed and it's, it's just, Fascinating. So, cons consider it. Yeah. There's a new book. Uh, well, you know, you mentioned New Jim Crow. Yeah, New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. she's, a, she's a lawyer. So, I mean, the way she comes, the New Jim Crow basically talks about um, just like the mass incarceration of just what people of color, mostly black folks. Um, I haven't read it yet. It's on my reading list for a class I have to, I'm taking. Um, but when I read it, I will share One of the things more information. That she mentions, though, is the war on drugs has become a way to control again uh, without the, the federal troops necessarily, but you do have troops, you have the police officers. Uh, they, once you're incarcerated, you lose a lot of your rights as a citizen. And some of the states today are going back and saying, okay, if you served your time in prison, then why should you not have the right to vote if you paid your debt to society? But uh, it takes away your right to vote, one of the things that uh, so vitally need. Yeah. What, was, what was the author of the new Japan? <laughs> Michelle Alexander. Alexander? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I'm not going to. I'm basically done. <laughs> but now I kind of want to open it up to this. <laughs> not even done yet. <laughs> um, this is the part. This is the, I really am not a huge lecturer. Um, anyone that really knows me knows that. Uh, I'm more of like a dialogue. I'm more of like a conversationalist. So I kind of want to open it up to the floor. And I already see it. I'm already <laughs> ready. He's like already ready. He's been waiting patiently. Okay, so uh, remember, I, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I just wanted to say, like, because uh, I was just talking to like my family and stuff. My brother's uh, he's like in the what, like seventh grade now or something. But um, he was talking about uh, he was he was basically just talking about how uh, like racism, how he was like taught that racism, uh, it's it's like it's done and, and it's only in the South now and blah blah blah. Uh, I just like me and my dad just like had this huge discussion about how like slavery is just like in a different form and it's, it's just always taking different forms and everything. And like it just like it, it got me to thinking about like when I was in elementary and middle school, what was taught is like oh all these great white people that did all these wonderful things for society and and then you get this one month with 28 days in it that talks about the the black people in society that have done whatever they've done. You know, that, that's just, you know, it's minimal compared to all these great things that everybody else has done. And it kind of perpetuates the, just the, the idea that, that just white people are better. And it's like, it, it doesn't just get ingrained into like, 
like white people's head, it gets ingrained in like everyone's head, like black people. Yeah. And Beverly everyone. Tatum calls it the smog, the smog that we all breathe. Whether you like it or not, you are breathing in racism of some sort. Whether you're breathing in, uh, you know, just white culture, um, like not learning about your own history. Like it took me until college. And my mom blessed me all the time. And my sisters were like, what the hell? But I did not recognize my own blackness until college. Because I went through 15 years of schooling at Christian Life and I didn't learn shit about, I'm sorry y'all, sorry. <laughs> right at like like the new deal basically like basically maybe like even like the industrial revolution and like up but like anything before that like didn't know anything about like slavery didn't know anything about like native american history didn't really know anything about like basically the mass genocide of native americans in the united states like not even until college you taught me, you taught me about my blackness, but you taught, you, I feel like you taught me about my blackness in a way that was still ingrained in like white culture, or I wouldn't say whitewash, but like ingrained still in like white culture. I wasn't, I don't feel like I was taught to like necessarily, and I don't, don't get me wrong, I don't like blame my parenting for this. Oh, I don't accept blame either. <laughs> I, 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 I blame society as a whole. You know, it's very hard to teach little, you know, black kids about, you know, to love themselves and to love their hair when you have hair commercials of white women just like, look how long my hair is and like, you know, look how silky it is and how straight it is. And you're sitting there looking at your hair and you're like, wow, shit, my hair is like curly and it's, you know, it's harsh and it's you know, it's doing all sorts of wild crazy things and you're like I gotta get my hair looking like that so what do you end up doing you end up perming your hair you end up putting chemicals in it to sit there and like straighten your hair out basically I mean I ruined my scalp basically doing that like you know you get scabs from that because it sits in your hair too long and your hair burns you're back there you're like all right yeah I know <laughs> um, that, and, that, and that stuff is not cute and that's just ingrained and this society, and that's the smog you're breathing. You're you're breathing in like this white culture, and even if you're being taught your black culture, it's being muted by all this, you know, this whiteness. Basically, that's a good way to put it. That it's muted. Even yeah. the messages you you are getting from parents, and, and it, it gets muted by kind of the loudness. Especially if you spend eight hours of your day with white people, like you're still. Gonna assimilate. Assimilate. Yeah, assimilate into that culture in a sense. I'm gonna go to you and then. I just wanted to add to what I heard saying too that like not even just the focus on white people, but even within racism. Like we read *To Kill a Mockingbird*, so that's okay. all about you know white savior. You know that the, we don't learn about the Black Panther Party. And, like I don't oh know. no, like you black definitely black people's the Black Panther Party. You probably wouldn't even learn the Black Panther Party, black black Panther party in. in in like college, yeah. Like, so like a black studies class with black professor, majority black people, and I think it's just because of this fear of the Black Panther Party. I, you know, there's still a fear that they're still within like a hate group. So just like the Black Lives Matter, just like the Black Lives Matter. There's so much similarity between Black Lives Matter and Black Panther Party. And if I had enough time, <laughs> if this was a course. We would watch, uh, what is it called? The, it's like a revolution or something, I watched it. No, it's the called the, the Black the black Mixtape, or just like, oh, black black Power. Power. yeah, Black Power Mixtape, watch that, that is super good. Is it on Netflix? Yes, it's on Netflix. Um, you probably can even watch it for free on YouTube if you don't have Netflix. Black Power Mixtape. Black Power Mixtape. And then another one that just came out is called The 13th, it's by one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite directors, and she kind of goes into a lot of that too. So, um, but yeah, you're not going to learn about the Black Panther women. You're not going to learn about Malcolm X. They're all too radical. Yeah. So. Oh, um, just regarding like the education system, I was reading Shaggy McIntosh's article for another class, and one of them was 
I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. And that's like something that I've never thought about. And I think it's interesting that like for people of color's history, it's elective classes. Mm -hmm. But for our, uh, or for like um, white people, it's just history class. And you know, for people of color, they have to take an extra class to learn about their history. That's why I get so mad. Every February, someone's like, why don't we have all white people in the room? And I'm just like, because you have all 12 months. Even you share it with you, you know, in February. <laughs> you know, like, I'm still, like, I did, you know, be celebrating Black History Month, and I'll still have to know White History Month, like, or not White History Month, just White History in general. And like you said, it's not even called White History, it's just history, you know? And then if you go into, you know, a university, then you have a, a, a whole other section for black, you know, black studies, you know. So, What's yeah. that, Margaret? We got to get okay. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to talk about, uh, like, the imprisonment uh, and, like, how they basically use that as slavery, like a different form. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like they pay people, like, pennies per hour, like, to do, like, jobs, you know, mm -hmm. and then, like, they, they do this for, what, 10, 15, 20 years because of a nonviolent crime, and, I mean, how is that not the same thing as slavery? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, like, if it's, if it's, you know, this guy, like, going and murdered, like, a person or something, like, yeah, that's cool, but, I mean, this guy's over here selling, like, dime bags, and now he's, like, got to go and bust rocks for 10 years, like, that's, it's not. No, no who you're, you're voting for. for. <laughs> no, who you're voting for. Uh, know the history of, of how they voted, and because that, that's important. Because if you know anything about Hillary Clinton, she was like about private prisons, and I mean, look into that because that she was about private pr prisons. Mm -hmm. Well, it was her. It was Bill Clinton it was that Bill. <laughs> passed the they strike you out. Yeah, the, the laws mm -hmm. that uh, incarcerated people with three strikes and you're out. You're going back and doing a lot more time. Mm -hmm. But I think that the folks have realized at this point in history yeah. that that's simply not working. And so there, there are going to be some changes. One thing that you said, you don't think that America will ever get out of racism. I do. I'm an optimist. Okay? Okay. I'm a political being, but I'm an optimist. Yeah. And the reason that they'll get out is because we are now talking more about things like this. Because I remember in my fourth grade, as fourth grade, never forget, my favorite teacher calls me up to the front. She says, Tom, Zelda, Warren, uh, Eleanor, will you please come to the front? We stood in the front of the class. We're in fourth grade now. And she said, children, the other children, this is what slaves look like. Wow. Now, can, you, yeah. <laughs> can you imagine that happening in any classroom of today? Not a, not a chance. The teachers that are in this room right now, yeah. they are going to teach with diversity. They're going to know uh, multicultural aspects of it. The country is changing on such a basis that it's scary to the folks that are uh, wanting to take their country back. And I'm asking, whenever I hear that statement, I say, how far back do you want to go? Because I'm not going with you. I'm not going back there. So I believe that there's a a friend of mine told me in 1968, I'm an old dude. I was 18 years old, and he says, there's something called the Tang of America, and it's going to happen. So you might as well get used to it and believe that racism is no longer going to be a, a, something that runs and drives our country. Because there are people out there that are interested in making these changes, willing to make the changes, and willing to talk about it. Now, I know that this is frightening to some, but get over those fears because it's here. I, I think even though we're talking about it, I think there's still going to be, what ends up happening is I think people become desensitized to it, um, desensitized to talking about racism. So even though I can sit here and you know lecture on racism until my face is blue, if people are not willing to make a change, like nothing's gonna change. And I, and I agree with you, like, that sort of racism is over. We are past overt racism, I would say, but I think we're not surpassed colorblind racism, where we are denying people, you know, almost denying their history of racism. So I could be talking to someone, they're like, 
yeah, you know, racism was horrible. You know, I apologize as a white person, and that sucks. But, you know, we have a black president. It's, you know, 2008, America did some amazing things. But we can't just look at one black person or just a, a couple of black people, a handful of black people that made it and just be like, all right, so now the other 40 million are doing all right. We, we can't look at that. And I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying, I'm just, that is, it's my way of thinking of why I don't think we will ever, uh, I don't think we will ever get past racism because racism is too tied to our foundation that and Jenny talked about this in her intro class, but there's too much wealth and power when it comes to racism. People have made too much money off racism to try to change it, I think. They're gonna change But, look at you. I just wanted to mention, or just a, a thought, with a lot of people now, or a lot of kids or grown-ups, whoever, dating opposite sex. So there's a lot of multicultural things happening, which now, you know, you're not going to see as many blue-eyed, blonde girls versus now you're starting to see more of a but mixture. See, you know what I think will end up happening right. because of that? I think we may not have to deal with necessarily like colorism or colorism to like black and white, mm -hmm. but it'll become like Brazil light to dark. But that's, I, that's here today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well I mean, that's, but, I that's think, here today. but I think it'll be even more if like, even if we have interracial marriages and relationships and we have interracial babies, like they're still gonna grow up. And I think the idea is still gonna be- Light skin versus dark skin. Light skin versus dark skin. Like we have it now, but it's, but it's more, the light skin versus dark skin is more- Within the black culture. In the black culture. You know. but, but here's the thing I'd say about that. As people get educated, and those light-skinned black people, uh, that's, that's, that stuff's going away. Trust me on this. That, that stuff is going away. Because people are becoming sensitized to those things that separate us. And for those, it's going to start out as a handful, but you know, one bad apple spoils uh, the whole barrel. Let, let racism be one of those things that uh, there's a lot of folks in there that are saying, this shouldn't be. Yeah. And so I think that that'll, that'll turn the whole barrel to the fact where they're not necessarily living based on color. I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to actually let you guys know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think it would take people of actual power to make that happen. I think, I think that it can happen. I just think it would take people with political power, economic power, to sit back and, and, and to see that, and to be willing to make that change. And they're and coming, for us to they're do coming, because they're the folks that are in this room, they're the folks that are out there in the public to recognize what this country has been and has done, and it's going to happen. Yeah. And if we, if we are willing to, to look at it and receive that, 